a webinar. Um, like Liz says, it's lovely to see some familiar faces on there and some new ones too. So um, some of you know me and have heard me before. Um, I um, run the Business Springboard with um, a colleague of mine. I'm uh, an HR specialist by trade. I do have an MA in Human Resource Management and a member of the CIPD. Um, one thing that we like about our training is that um, all our trainers, including myself, are practitioners as well as trainers. So we do bring real life events to our training. Um, and I deliver a number of different modules within the Business Springboard around leadership management, um, HR, and people management and soft skills. So that's a bit about me. Um, as always, our the slides are copyright for the Business Springboard, and any advice that I give isn't intended to be individual to you, but hopefully give you a guidance. Um, so that's uh, the usual disclaimer there at the beginning. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Today, I want to talk about managing performance, which is one of I think probably our one of our most requested areas to do some training and development on and, and a very popular webinar topic. In fact this morning I have delivered a masterclass in it as well, so I might be all managing performance out in about an hour's time. Um, but it shows what a very key topic it is. For me it's one of those management processes that has a lot of assumptions. When we people move into management roles and we perhaps pro promote into management, um, like with a lot of management skills, we just presume that people can't um, uh, can manage performance. But it's a specific skill, it's a specific tool, um, and it's not going to come naturally to everybody. And there are some quite good um, procedures we can put in place to make that uh, work a lot more effectively. So a very popular topic, and some of the things that we will talk through, and uh, in, the, in the session I did this morning, some people said, yeah, I can remember learning about these when I did my management training, but I kind of forgot about them, and I, you know, you don't tend to use them, but the key areas. So there might be about a refresh in some of the things, and hopefully some uh, good new pointers in there too. So we're going to talk Firstly, in performance management, about role definition and performance measures, and that's one of a key area to understand what constitutes good, bad, and okay performance as a starting point. We're going to look at some business impact of performance levels, a little bit about some team variance, and then I'm going to give you some practical tools about managing performance um, at the end. Now, as Liz says, great to use the chat box um, and communicate with me as we go along. If there's anything that crops up that I, um, is um, relevant to answer, then I will. But if not, we will have a question answer session at the end that we can come back to. So firstly, looking at why we should manage performance. Um, Everybody likes being valued. I'm sure you know from yourself. You know we need to know what we're doing, and people do perform better. There's mounds of research to show this. When they know um, what they should do, how they should do it, they get praise for doing it well, and they know the consequences for doing it not so well. So it needs to to occur in all businesses. It needs to occur in quite everything that we do. Um, if we don't set any targets or measurements. Our employees can feel unguided and lost, and they're not sure exactly what they should do. Um, very importantly, if they're doing a good job and we don't tell them what they're doing that makes it good, how will they know to repeat it? And if they're doing a not-so-good job, then how can they know to put it right? And again, it sounds quite basic, but how often do we quite really neglect to do that, to be, to be quite clear from the beginning? Um, I did tell a story when I'm delivering this. Um, uh, about a, an experience I had personally, which I think I, I do train in managing performance, but something that happened with me, you know, in my my personal life at home when I I, I had some services of a cleaner. Um, I was thinking about telling this story and thought, did the cleaner perhaps join the webinar, which wouldn't be so good, but anyway, hopefully not. Um, anyway, I did at the beginning, didn't really know what I wanted, and a cleaner came along and, and asked what she should do, and I said, well, just clean. And then when I wasn't too happy with what she was doing, was I in a position to say anything? Because I hadn't actually defined what I wanted to, to do in the first place. And there's lots of assumptions in there. And how often do when we bring people on board or give them new tasks, do we make assumptions in management that people know what they do, um, uh, know what they should do, know what we want out of it? Another key reason to do it is to get increased productivity. It's not about beating people with a big stick to make them work um, 
uh, harder or faster, but it's about having a good structured approach. Um, and people who are feeling more positive will work, be more productive as well. Putting my HR hat on for a while, it's an absolute must for safety net for legislation. All too often, I get phone calls as an HR consultant to say, we've got an employee, they just not perform well, I need to get rid of them. Well, have you told them? No, no, but I'm just sick. If they've got to go. It's small enough. It's a little bit here and a little bit there. I now need to get rid of them. And it's a really unfortunate situation that they've um, carried a bad employee or somebody who's not performing at the level that they want them to for a long time, and it comes to breaking point. And unfortunately, in that case, a dismissal then can be risky or very costly. Um, and in tribunal cases, to look at those, you know, anything where you would be challenged on fair decisions, you need to have the evidence there about managing performance. And why shouldn't we? Isn't it fair? Wouldn't you want to be treated that way if something wasn't going so well? Wouldn't you want to know that it wasn't going so well? And wouldn't you want to know how to put it right? So very important uh, area of managing performance, but unfortunately one area that often does get quite neglected. Uh, and I'd be quite interested to hear from around the chat box if you did feel that in your organisations, if, if, if performance was managed well and you kept good records and it had an, an overall aim to restore back to an acceptable level, because that's what we're talking about here as well. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so one of the first things I, I mentioned there is about defining the role and defining your performance measure, and this is where I spent an awful lot of time this morning in the masterclass discussing about what are our measures, um, because if we don't know what's going to constitute a good performance um, and not so good in performance or acceptable performance and how can we manage against it and this can be in you know we've got a whole load of people from different organizations in the webinar today this may be number of sales it might be number of widgets produced it might be accuracy of data whatever that be when we manage people's performance we need to have that measure in there um, and uh, you know how you put that together, if you've got quantitative data, that's brilliant because it's sometimes easier to look at numbers, but also qualitatively, what would constitute good customer service? What's acceptable um, to you? What do you want to achieve in your organization? So you need to really have a good think first about what makes good performance. And that can be in your teams too for an HR team. And you might need to be a little bit more creative of thinking about what those measures are to make sure you've got something defined that you can quite easily measure. Um, so <clears throat> think about what you want to achieve and what those performance measures are. When we give somebody a job to do as well, um, you know, a job description is a really good way of defining what somebody's responsibilities are. What it shouldn't be is a work instruction. So, for example, if somebody has a responsibility to make hot, hot beverages, the work descri job description should say that. It shouldn't be a work, dis uh, work instruction that says open the cupboard, put the kettle on, get the tea bags out, etc., etc. So, think <coughs> about how that role is defined. Now, in an ideal world, we'd all have a lovely, um, nicely produced job description that was kept up to date and there, and we could refer to. And many organizations will, but I also see a lot of organizations that don't, and some you know, large and small ones alike that don't have them in there either. Um, we, we should have something in some place to define that role, whether it's verbal or written. And also think of custom and practice, because things will evolve and responsibilities will change. So if you do have something defined in a job description or responsibility, make sure that's reviewed regularly to it's kept up to date with how things are around here and what evolves and changes. And then very importantly on those measures, so think about the qualitative and quantitative and think about what does make good Okay, <clears throat> and bad performance. Um, an example I like to use is perhaps in sales here. Um, if you want to achieve, for example, 10 sales per month and you have an employee who achieves nine, they are underperforming. Now, it's quite easy to say well, they tried, it's nearly nine or one month they achieved 11 and then it's been nine and 10 and nine and nine and 10 and 11, but that's still underperformance. Now, if they are achieving one less every month in a year, that's 12, so that can be quite big. Um, <clears throat> so we really need to assess what that level is and if they don't hit it, they don't hit it. I had a very interesting conversation this morning with an organization that um, really values education and they like their employees to achieve some um, certifications in their industry. 
and one of the managers was saying because they they paid a bonus around this and their measure is you've achieved this qualification or you haven't and there was an, uh, an employee who tried very hard and she was one point short of achieving the qualification she didn't get a bonus and we had a big debate about fairness and should she be given some reward for trying but if she didn't achieve it, she didn't achieve it. So what is your measure? Is your measure trying or is your measure attaining? And you need to be quite consistent in that. It's important for fairness in managing people, but it's important for you yourself to understand. The other thing is the terminology that I find um, some people get a bit hung up on because acceptable actually says that it's, it's accepted. It's what you want. It's there and it's the level that's, uh, that, that you want to achieve as your people. But acceptable can have a bit of a negative connotation. So it's the way it's framed with your staff and they understand that that is what you want and you or yourself understand it. Um, also think about if you have a group of people, I think you, if I saw an assessment of a group and everybody was exceptional in every skill that was needed for that group, I'd either think that it wasn't a true assessment or you had a really unique team because we are all diverse and you won't have, um, you know, people should or will generally as people do have different skills in different areas. So thinking about <coughs> what you need, what skills you need and what your correct measures are and applying those measures consistently throughout the team is very important in, uh, in performance management. Um, within your... Um, employee group uh, yeah, please. Um, you will have a number of different types of performance and these will have a very different business impact and I think you need to be looked at in a different way um, very importantly um, managers tend to spend a lot of their time managing poor performance really that is the performance that we don't want to see in our business but managers spend the most time there the ultimate goal should be restore that to acceptable level if that performance cannot be restored to that acceptable level, we do have to ask the question, should that person who is um, demonstrating that performance be in the role? The slightly below average performance is that one that sits just below the radar that we leave and we don't manage and we tend to not really take this on board as managers because have we been too picky or is there too much? Um, the slightly below average performance tends to cost organisations the most. And in cost, I don't just mean financial cost, um, but I mean time and resource, et cetera, et cetera. They're sitting just below the line. They might come into work two minutes late every day and you think, mm, I'm not going to pick that up because I'm being a bit picky. Well, it's two minutes lost every day. So we leave that until it becomes a really big bugbear for us and we kind of explode and want an immediate um, reaction to it. So they, the slightly below average is a key area, and I think it's one of the areas where if we've spent more management time, it's one of the easiest to restore to the level that we want. So a very key area of slightly below average performance. A sudden fall in performance to me generally means there's some um, external factor that has an impact on that either in the organization or out of the organization and that would would be about understanding your team and looking a bit further and having a lot of review and investigation your aggressive players can be really really useful um, but they um, will tend to be um, quite individual and not team players so they will kind of trample over whoever they can to get to the top really useful as long as you understand what they do and you set them about the, rest, the right task um, sometimes they may upset colleagues or customers wherever that may be um, so as long as they're channeled in the right direction they're really really useful but think of the business impact if you had a team full of aggressive players and one of your key performance measures was customer service you just need to be quite careful that those people were, were channeled in the right direction a high performer who's not meeting objectives is also very interesting. Um, and this is where I see quite often people will you know, um, either recruit or move people into a role who are very good at something and move them into a role that's actually not for them. It's kind of square, square peg and round hole. You can see this um, in a sales team quite often where your best salesperson who's fantastic at sales is then moved into a sales management role. And fundamentally sales and people management require two very different skills 
And I've seen an awful lot of people in that situation that have just crashed and burned because they haven't got people management skills. It's then really negative because they feel down because they're not hitting targets. They've been doing, used to doing so well and being regarded highly. And then suddenly you have to manage somebody's poor performance and you either end up having to manage them out of the business um, or put them back into a sales role which they could lose face or they leave and that's really quite devastating. So really think about what roles you put people in and where they can do well and what's needed in the organisation. The emotional employee, and usually every organisation has one, um, and it's quite the scariest one to manage really. These people um, do let the emotions overrun and as managers we can avoid these people. Because they um, they are emotional, they may get tearful, either positive or negative emotions, and perhaps not take on board feedback because they're being too positive, or get upset and teary. And uh, as managers, we tend to avoid these people. Two very key ones, very interesting when you look around on what courses are around. Who's ever seen a course that says managing good performance versus how many courses have you seen that says managing poor performance? Um, we quite ignore these uh, these people. Um, and I recently did some appraisals with the company, and they said, oh, this appraisal's going to be fine. She knows she's good. I don't have to tell her anything. She knows I tell her every day. And this lady in the appraisal, to be formally sat down and told you're doing really good, and you're one of our best employees, was such a big motivator, and she really welcomed that feedback. But because she was good all of the time, we just kind of left them. Um, and these are people we want to see in our organization. We want good performers. We want over performers. So let's do something with them. And I'm going to pick up on that point a bit later as well. <coughs> when we manage performance, um, we also need to think about what we can control. There will be um, a limited number of things that we can control. Quite a lot we can influence and quite a lot we can't control. So to give you an example here, if I look at attendance management, <clears throat> um, if somebody is, uh, is consistently late, we can't actually physically go and drive and pick them up and bring them to work on time. We cannot control that they decide to be late. We cannot control that they don't get out of bed at time. We cannot control anything in their home life that makes a difference. What we can do is influence that, and we can. Um, there is certain control measures that we can do internally, like we might have a formal policy to deal with lateness. We might implement attendance management. We might have return to work interviews, for interviews, and review meetings for, for lateness and, and review meetings, etc. We might have a financial penalty. So we've got some control measures there, but we cannot physically bring that person into work. We can influence them coming into work with those measures as well. So if you think of this as a puddle of how it, how it goes out there and the influence that they have and how bigger the circles get, there will be a lot of stuff that we can't control in management. If you have an employee that's you know, particularly laid back as a person and you, know, you think that their attitude haven't got enough urgency in the work that they do, you cannot control their personal characteristics. You can influence that. Um, by coaching and mentoring and the management style and the procedures you put in place. And you might have some control in there of things like bonuses, etc. But we have to be aware to spend our time as management in the things that we can control and influence and not in things we can't control. So just move on to the next slide. Thank you, Liz. Um, the, uh, when we look at employees' performance, um, I quite like the comfort strikes panic, which some of you might have seen before, um, of how we look for people to perform. Now, we will move throughout these three phases, all of us, in, um, in various amounts. I, you know, realistically, will everybody just stay in one? I think the answer is most definitely no. Um, we need to look at where people are going to perform best. Now, there will be time that we need some time in comfort and some dying time. There will be time when the organization or the work task or whatever puts us into panic mode, a deadline that has to be missed, a customer query that we have, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but a good place to be and a very productive place to be is stretch, where we test it. It's quite rewarding because we're testing our skills, we're testing what we do. And, and this is very general and can be applied to any role. You know, you can look at this 
through, you know, right th through your organisation, from your MD in these roles, through to, um, you know, your accounts administrator. Obviously, the content will be different, but the same sort of um, principle in each one of them. Now, I know that personally, I perform best in stretch. When I'm just pushed a bit, when I've got things to do, um, and I, I need to have that for my own personal well-being, there'll be times when I say, oh, I'd just like to go into comfort for a while and have a bit of an easy life. But if I get into that, I get a bit twitchy and a bit itchy feet, and I can't stay in there long. For me personally, being in comfort is as detrimental as being in panic to my overall performance. But you've got to understand your staff and understand yourself and understand where you, you perform best and where your um, staff will perform best. When you get pushed into panic, um, sometimes logical thinking is lost and more errors and things can occur. But it will happen at times. It can be quite exhilarating. There's that rush of adrenaline and it can be quite a good place to be. But prolonged in panic isn't good. It's not good for our physical well-being or our mental well-being or our productivity. So have a think about your team. So when you're looking at performance and reasons for poor performance and how you want to manage it, think about where your staff are and what can you put in place to perhaps get people into stretch, either back from panic or push up from comfort. But also think about a bit of a split that there will times that people need to move into all three as well. Okay, so... To uh, move on towards the end of the um, the webinar to some practical tools to help you manage poor performance. Um, and one of the major things that I will say is please identify problems before they become a major barrier. So look of a regular review of staff. If you have an annual appraisal system, fantastic, but let's not just do it once every year. Um, you know, I've uh, debated this morning the benefits of having weekly, fortnightly, monthly review sessions with staff um, that should have a structure and also a time limit on them. We can't spend all of our time doing this because we do have jobs to do at the end of the day. But look at what problems crop up. Think about those people that sit just below that line of acceptable performance and identify these and work with them before you get to things being a major problem. Um, very key is get your facts together, investigate and discuss it with the person. Um, don't jump to conclusions, you know, sudden drops in performance, why would that be? Um, have they got the right skills and tools? Setting objectives and, and having your expectations is absolutely clear. Um, for those of you who listen to any of my others, I do like my smarter, my other webinars, I like my smarter objectives, so make sure things are specific, measurable, achievable, um, realistic, time bound. And then my ER enjoyable and recorded as well. Um, we perform better doing things that we like doing. And enjoyable doesn't need to be all fun games, laughing, what have you. So you can get enjoyment from a number of different things, including recognition and reward at the end. It doesn't need to be monetary reward. Um, monitor and review. So if we've got a poor performance in there, set some objectives. And then make sure you come back to it. So if you um, address somebody's poor timekeeping, tell them what you need to see. So we need you to be on, for example, if it was a lateness, we need you to be at work at your desk for 9 o'clock. And we'll sit down in a week's time, review the week uh, that's, that's uh, passed and where you are. So make sure every monitoring view system is in place as well. Um, the developing motivating comes into leadership skills, and it's the way that we uh, we do this. Management and leadership are two quite different things. Management is about um, the process and how we do things. Leadership is the way that we do it, so we have to draw on our softer skills of a leader there to make sure we develop and motivate. Remove any obstacles that we can do. You know, are there any IT problems that we can look at? Um, any um, you know functional things in a person's work that we can change that will help us achieve the objectives. Now, discipline again um, can be seen as really negative, and it depends how you term it. And some organisations do have capability policies, which are in fact a disciplinary procedure, um, but um, you know called something different in the capability because it's a bit softer. But ultimately, if somebody is not performing and you've gone through a process of developing uh, and trying to coach and develop an objective setting and, and bring performance back up to where it needs to be, there may be a time that you need to address this under a disciplinary um, procedure as a capability issue. Now, 
my views of disciplinary, and bearing in mind I am usually on this side of the table for a disciplinary, they're a positive tool to say, look, there's a problem, this is what we need, this is how we're going to help you, and this is what we need to see. They're about, they're not about battering people with a big stick, they're about restoring. Um, so that's why I see them as positive and say, right, there's a problem, we need to put it right. We need to acknowledge it and put it right. And I think that's looking at the skills of the disciplinary and how that's managed within your organization. There's nothing I like more to have a disciplinary, to highlight an issue, and then see somebody perform. I think that's a really positive thing. Um, how I do see people react to disciplinary is probably one of three ways in these issues. They probably think, right, you know, stuff you, you know nothing, I'm great, and carry on exactly the same, in which case you'd be managing them in further disciplinary action or they would leave. I see the, the best way that I just said I love to see where they say, yep, yeah, there's a problem, I pull my socks up and um, turn it round, and that's fantastic and what we want to see. And the probably hardest for us to manage is where they say, yep, yeah, there's a problem, they try to put it right, but unfortunately they just haven't got the capability, and those are quite hard to deal with. Um, so, you know, we do need to think that we have got that as part of our toolbox to deal with any um, Yeah, um, Liz has, uh, we've recently ran uh, a webinar last week on um, cap dealing with capability issues that Liz has posted a link to as well on unfair dismissal. Okay, and moving on, um, I just wanted to finish off on a, on a positive um, about managing good performance because as I said, it's one area that we, we really often neglect and I say I've never found a training course yet that's, uh, that's called managing good performance. We want good performance in our organization. We want to get people to perform well. Um, and we want to spend some, some management time in it. So think about things that we can do to manage performance um, that's very, very good, how we give the feedback to that. Um, can we use these people as uh, examples or train new people or buddy in? Um, what can we do? Because what we want to do is find out how they're doing it and, uh, and replicate with the rest of the team. So if we just sit them in a corner and don't say anything to them because we know they're really good, we might have a bit of a problem. But how can we perhaps highlight that and get more from it? Think about rewards that you give um, very good performers. Another thing that I often get asked as well, you know, the, the top of pay scale, we can't give them any more money, but they're really good, don't want to lose them. Reward doesn't just mean financial reward. Um, if you look at some um, motivational theories, etc., there's a lot more comes from recognition and the work itself, so it can really motivate people to do well. Um, and money can be short-term motivator once it's an acceptable standard. So think of other types of reward, and the recognition is going to be a very powerful tool as well, um, which is absolutely key. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the webinar, and i um, more than happy to answer any queries or questions that anybody has. Please do use the um, chat box if there's anything that you want to ask in there. Um, Liz has posted that link to the other webinar, which I'm sure um, you will find useful in there, and i um, happy to take any questions. Yeah, um, I think I might have bombarded with an awful lot of information. Um, hopefully it will be useful. It's um, uh, a, a taster into a very wide and vast area of managing performance and I say something that um, we always get a lot of requests for for our training programs that we go on. Um, so just no one just get on to the next one. Uh, yeah, so we have got a question coming through while we wait for that. Um, if this is an area that so we do find very popular, and at the Business Springboard we do offer um, training solutions very tailored to um, to people's needs. So if that was something anybody wanted to pick up with, we do have a program of bite-sized masterclasses which is available on our website. A Yorkshire listing is on there, but we can do that in other locations or, of course, in-house. Um, so there's more information on our website, which is up there too. Um, okay, I'll just answer questions that come in. Amy, is the comfort stretch panic a model? What's the name of it? 
Um, it's a, oh, you've stumped me there, Amy, of what the model is. Um, it's a very well-known, I think, phase um, in there. I will look to see if there's any resource that I can send on to you, and I will email you that if I, uh, if I come in with anything, Amy. But uh, So you've caught me out with the name of the model. Um, it might be one of my Joannisms, like my smarter, um, that I like to have. But comfort stretch and panic is a very, um, you know, quite well used um, term within there. But I will have a look, and if there's anything that I can send it on to you, um, Carol, how would you encourage them to recognise the good performers? Um, Carol, I think that um, comes right back to understanding your measures in there, and right back at the beginning. And it's no all too often area that we neglect, so we don't define what would be good, acceptable, and poor performance. So. Um, as many measures that we have, and I do appreciate it's not always um, achievable to have some quantitative measures, but um, so that we have got to be subjective at times and have some qualitative measures. But um, to have measures in there, you know, if you relay this to other things that you might do, for example, when you're um, doing a skills assessment for people and there has got to be some subjective measures, then just make sure it's recognized in there of what would make exceptional. If we don't understand ourselves as managers why this person's accept exceptional, how can we look to recognize it or give that feedback or re um, reproduce it in other people? Um, one thing I quite like to do is do a skills matrix for a team well, list, list down the team members and then their, the core competencies required in that team. And that could be things like, you know, Word, Excel, it could be customer service, it could be the IT system, it could be a qualification, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can score the people on a, a score from, for example, one to five, where one is no skill and five is excellent. It's a very good visual. It can make you look, it can also help you for succession planning as well and look at where your risk areas are if anybody left the business. But I think it comes right back to the start of defining what your measures are. Um, I hope that answers a few. Jackie, if the relationship between manager and employee is completely broken down, how would you manage performance via mediation? Um, it would depend on, on the seconds. I think I need to know a little bit more about the context of how you would mean that. Um, of what the issues were. Was your performance issues there with the manager or with the employee or with both? Um, a mediation, I think we've got to re try to resolve any workplace conflicts, but again, be information specific in that. Look at how the relationship had bro broke down and what you want to achieve it and, and have that evidence of their feedback. I do, I am, um, I believe I'm delivering another webinar I have in the past on given feedback, um, which is week after next, um, another webinar on giving feedback that may be useful in that situation um, to talk about how we give feedback and very information specific. And I think you've got to be um, in mediation, understand what the issues are, make sure there's no bullying or harassment um, issues to start with, that you can get people together and have an objective of what you want to get out of it. We will perhaps never get everybody to like each 